God, we thank you for your word, and we ask that what we just sang would uh, be true of uh, these next moments as we study your word, that you would speak to us and give us humble hearts, teachable hearts, that you would uh, receive glory in all that we do. Now, Lord, we ask that our love and affection would grow for Christ our Savior, and I ask that you would help me to preach clearly and boldly and be out of the way of the text. I pray this in your name. Amen. All right, well, go ahead and turn with me in your Bibles to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. I uh, find it a little bit comical. I have uh, in my notes here the uh, kind of a little cover page where I put the text that we're going to go through on the upcoming Sunday that I'm preparing for. And it says James chapter 1, verses 19 through 20. The reason why that's comical is because we're not even going to get through all of verse 19 this morning, so sorry, but uh, I think that as we mine out uh, this first part of verse 19, uh, hopefully you'll see why and hopefully your heart will be both challenged and encouraged as we walk through this, Uh, but we are going to go ahead and begin our time reading all of verses 19 through uh, 21 to see this whole section together, and then we'll just begin to dive in here. So James chapter 1, starting at verse 19, says this, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, Put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. This morning marks a little bit of a a kind of a major shift in in this letter that James writes here. Uh, We've gone through James walking us through trials and how to respond to trials and, and the ultimate outcome of trials and, and then in turn how to think through temptations that happen in our lives when we're tempted to sin, to never blame God for any of that. And, and uh, a couple weeks ago, we focused in on the character of God and looked at some pretty specific attributes of God, reminding us of, of kind of this grand nature and this grand uh, uh, even uh, area of study of the attributes of God in and of itself. And yet with all of those teachings and uh, reminders that James has already walked us through, with all of that truth that we're walking, that we've already been walked through, uh, there, there's somewhat of a, of a linchpin that, that really keeps uh, that being applicable in our lives, that uh, keeps all of that together. And this text this morning acts I would say, kind of as a, a linchpin to the whole letter in and of itself. You see, when, when you're sitting and hearing a sermon be, being preached, or not even just a sermon, but when you're talking with someone, you're, you're hearing what they're saying, and in a sermon you're hearing truth, but that's only part of receiving truth, right? The, the words going into your ears and you understanding them in your mind is only a part of receiving truth, and not only that... Once you have received truth, we don't stop there, right? We receive truth, and then what are we supposed to do? Respond, right? As believers, when we open up the Word of God, when we read the Bible, whether it's read out loud or we're reading it to ourselves, we're receiving truth from God's Word, but it's not enough if we just stop there. We're called to actually respond. Our lives are called to look differently in light of what it is that we receive, I want you to think about this for a minute. Think about this list of commands that we find from the Bible. Love your neighbor. Right? Forgive as Christ have, has forgiven you. Do not lie. Be angry and do not sin. Let the thief no longer steal. Right? Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Put away all bitterness and wrath, anger, uh, clamor, slander. Must all be put away. Abstain from sexual immorality. Uh, these are all probably things that you have heard before, right? You probably didn't hear anything on that list. I was like, oh, I didn't realize I wasn't supposed to lie. I, I've never heard of not giving, having corrupting talk. I, wait, wait, what's this forgiveness thing that you're talking about here? I'm supposed to forgive people when, when they offend me? 
Now, you're probably not surprised by anything on that list, and yet, just because you have heard the things on that list, if all of us are honest, just for a moment, we know that we are not heeding perfectly everything on that list, right? That, that we re- read things like this and think, Lord, thank you, for forg- thank you for forgiving me for uh, lying this past week, or thank you for forgiving me for not loving my neighbors the way that I should have. And you can walk down a list like this and realize, yeah, I've heard all of that before, but that doesn't mean that I've heeded it. It doesn't mean that I have uh, obeyed it. It doesn't even mean that I fully have received that. See, the problem is often how we receive and then in turn, how we respond. I want you to realize this morning that your response to any truth, your response to anything that you find in the Word of God is going to be connected to how it is you have received, to the reception of what it is that you're reading, whether it's healthy or poor. And so what we're going to do and what James really exposes for us here in these few verses is we're going to be looking at the reception of truth in verses 19 through 20. And then in turn, what should our response to truth be? That's going to be verse 21. I, uh, when I first was studying this this past week and putting all this together, I thought we were going to get through all four of the points from verses 19 through 20. Joke's on me, and then in turn you, we're going to get through the first point this morning. Uh, But all of these points will be under the heading, Four Practical Steps to Rightly Receive the Word of Truth. Four Practical Steps to Rightly Receive the Word, to, to Rightly Receive the Truth. I'm going to give you all four of them because I kind of want to see, I want you to see where we're going. And this morning we're only going to focus on the first one, and that is humble your heart. The first one, humble your heart. Step number two, tame your tongue. Step number three, control your emotions. Point number four, remember your motivation. It's a little bit funny that this is called four, that, that, uh, that the proposition here is four practical steps because uh, I'm sure you've heard this in conversation with me and uh, whether done counseling with me or things like that, I've probably said things along the lines of, sorry, there's no like two-step solution to this or there's no like 12 steps I can give you that, you know, here are four steps to rightly receive the, the truth. Sorry, I, I think it's from the text, so we're going to stick with it. Before we get into that first step, though, I mean, you know, notice the transition that is inspired, that is helpful, but when you first, at first glance, it's kind of not necessary, but it's important. James doesn't say in verse 19, let every person be quick to hear, right? There's something he puts before that. Look at where he starts with another command, know this my beloved brothers. He could have very well just skipped that and just jumped right into let every person, but he starts out with know this. What's really interesting about this is this is really a direct appeal to the mind. It's a direct appeal to the mind. He doesn't start off with, as believers, I want you to do this. No, he starts out with know this. This is a command to have a a settled state of mind on something. In essence, you could say that what James is about to lay out for us should be a matter of fact. It should be a matter of fact. It should be a given. It should be something that we know to be true. Uh, This word that he uses, this command that he uses for know, it's used commonly throughout the Bible and throughout the New Testament. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5, Paul uses it in the context of a definite, uh, definitive theological truth, in Ephesians 5, 5, he says this, For you may be sure of this, same word, for you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who has covetous, that is, that is an idolater, 
or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Again, he's laying out a definitive theological truth using that exact same word. And in the, in, in the book of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews uses, again, this same word in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 17. And now he, this word is being used to, in regards to a historical fact. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 17 says, For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit blessings, talking about Esau, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. So notice that this word is used for definitive theological truth as being a matter of fact, as it's also being used for historical facts, things that anyone who would have been reading this and knew about the history of Esau would have said, no, that's true, that is a matter of fact. And so now James is using the exact same word to present to us what he's about to write. This is a matter of fact, you must know this. Just as factual as Esau was in history and just as definitive as the very character of God, this must be affirmed as true. You must know this. You must know this. What's also interesting and helpful to remember about this section of James specifically, I'm sure uh, if I were to ask you, hey, what are some things that are mentioned in the second part of the first chapter of this letter of James, uh, I, I'd be willing to bet that, that one of the first things that would come up is the whole idea of don't just be hearers of the word, right, but be doers of the word. That would probably be at the top of your list. And yet... We can leapfrog how James starts this whole section, not with doing, but how we hear, right? Not, not with just the response, but how, what, what it is that we know, how we receive. Truth has to come first. Truth has to come first. That's why for many, when they first get saved, and praise the Lord for this, right? There's a zeal to want to want to go out and share the gospel. There's a zeal to want to do ministry. There's a zeal to want to go and live for the Lord and, and to represent Him. And, and, and we should want that. And yet that zeal has to be first informed, right? With truth. All right? If you go out and share the gospel and you don't know the, the truths of the gospel, if you have not thought through how to share the gospel itself, then you could actually end up doing more damage than good. You could say things that are not true. You could share things that, that God has not said about him in his word. And so we take that zeal, we take that passion, we inform it with truth, and then we go. We must know. In fact, if you really think about it, knowing is, at, is really at the core of who we are as believers. We're going to just keep up with me if you want. I'm going to be flipping through my Bible. You can flip through your Bible. I want to just compel, I want you to be compelled by just how much knowing is at the core of who we are as believers. We'll start off with Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You have the renewal of the mind mentioned there and also mentioned in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, starting at verse 20. Sorry, it should be chapter 4, not chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 20. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of what? Of your minds, 
and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. You have the renewal of your mind. John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 14. It says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Salvation is to know Christ. Eternal life in and of itself is to know God. We think of the high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, verse 3. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. But it's not just the renewal of the mind. It's not just the uh, salvation being to know Christ. It's not just eternal life being to know God. But growing in the knowledge of Christ truly is what maturity and sanctification is all about. Again, if you go back to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we attain to the unity of of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Again, appealing to the mind. Our mind being uh, growing in our knowledge and understanding of Jesus Christ to fullness. Knowing truth actually protects us and protects the church. Go ahead and go to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, starting at verse 9. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with what? With knowledge and all discernment. So that, and here's the purpose, right? Why is it that Paul is praying this? So that you may approve what is excellent. And so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Not only does truth and knowledge of Christ protect us and the church, but it's also truly the, uh, a crucial part and the crucial part to the unity that we have as a church. If you fast forward in Philippians to Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, Any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and, in case you didn't catch it the first time, and of one mind. Again, in Philippians, if you fast forward to Philippians chapter 4, we think about knowing being at the core of who we are as believers. It's when we're in those moments of despair, when we're in those moments of anxiety, when we're in those moments of, of fear and needing comfort and peace. The Bible doesn't tell us, hey, just, just make yourself feel better, right? It doesn't tell us, hey, throw on a Hallmark movie and uh, get the emotions flowing just so that you can start to feel better. No, what does the Bible appeal to? Our mind to what we know. Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice, uh, sorry, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the God of peace, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your, your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, what's the command here? 
think about these things. We have learned and received and heard and seen in me practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. How, how does the believer protect their mind? It's with truth. It's what you know. It's what's at the very core of, who, of what it means to be a believer. In essence, you could say that to live faithfully before the Lord is to live out what you know to be true. That's what it means to live faithfully before the Lord. And so back in James, James says, know this. Know this, my beloved brothers. The same uh, affectionate address that James uses uh, earlier, he's already used earlier in this letter and that he uses throughout the letter. And, and I mentioned this before, but oftentimes you'll see this address in this letter uh, to, to even signify a little bit of a shift in James' thinking or a, a, a new emphasis in what he's about to write. And, and I believe he continues to, to use such a, a loving and affectionate term because remember, he's writing to these believing Jews who had been dis- dispersed, right, who, who are in the midst of trials and persecution, thus where he started in, the, in chapter 1 here of counting it joy. And so he wants to remind them that he, he's writing this not from a, a theological high horse, not from a higher position than them, but as a, a fellow brother, as a fellow believer, even as a fellow Jew to them, the original audience there, keeping the clear connection and love obvious and on the forefront of their minds. And so what is it that we are to know? What is it that James wants us to know? He says, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. In essence, this is kind of a, a... a general principle that James goes on to write. It's, some even believe that this is a general proverb that in some way, shape, or form would have already been floating around uh, as kind of a well-known nugget of wisdom, if you will. And, and when they would have read this back then, and you and I, when we read this, we're probably not thinking, oh, this isn't wise. Like, hey, Joey, help me understand how this is a wise approach to to understanding and listening to anything. No, it's kind of obvious, right? This is such clear wisdom that all of us can relate to. So let's break this down as we walk through this. He says, first, let every person be. Just as a reminder, this is all-inclusive, right? No one is excluded from this. From the least to the greatest, let every person be. And, and that, that command there, that, that verb there, to be, is in the present tense. This is to be a constant reality for us. This is to be true at all times. What, what, what James is about to tell us, to be quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger, this is to be at all times in our lives. It has to be actively fought for. Or to be actively engaged in this. Just by way of illustration, uh, I don't know how many of you have ever been involved in, uh, in like, uh, uh, whether a music department somewhere or doing sound. And one of the things that you have to do is do a sound check. Right, I'm sure you guys probably know what a sound check is. If, if, is. if you don't, you can ask Daryl afterward and he can walk you through it in more detail. But for a sound check to work, if I ask someone, hey, do you mind going up there and helping us with the sound check? And they go up to the microphone and they say, hi. And then they stop talking. Some of you guys are laughing because you've done it before. I'm like, just keep going, right? Keep going, right? Well, why? Right? There needs to be some, a constant audible signal for us to actually do a sound check, right? It has to be constant sound that is needed. It has to be present at all times. And in the same way, when you're doing a sound check, when you're doing a microphone check, that it only works when sound is actually coming out and going through, we must constantly be living this way and applying this, and it only works if we are actively constantly, consistently applying this. 
Lots of illustrations with this, right? You could think about when you're grilling out and you're, you have a, your, your steak or fish for some of you or maybe cauliflower for others. Uh, when, when you're grilling, that's only going to cook. You're only going to get the desired result if there's actually a constant flame, right? That's it. I'll leave it at that. Hopefully it's clear of what it means by constantly, uh, constantly being this. Let every person be. Some of you guys are going to have problems with both of those illustrations, I'm sure. But sorry, that's all I got. We're to always be applying this wisdom. Always. And so what's the implication? Well, these four steps that we're talking about this morning, they must be constant. They must be applied every single time we think about truth. Every time we open up the Word. Every time we're being discipled or discipling. Every time we're sitting under a sermon. Every time we're even praying and thinking through truth. This must be active. And so the first step, humble your hearts. Humble your hearts. You may be looking down at your Bible and saying, well, I see being quick to hear, but... Help me understand how that is humbling the heart. Well, so some of us, it's obvious because it's really hard to just listen, right? But it should be no surprise that the first step to rightly receiving truth is to listen in essence, right? This is kind of communication 101 for anyone here that has children, for anyone here that has a spouse, Right? For anyone here that uh, is involved in school or any kind of workplace, right? this is kind of communication 101, to listen. Right? A poor listener will always cause issues. If you, if, if you want to get to the bottom of any conflict in any relationship, you can almost guarantee that in some way, shape, or form, a failure to actually listen is, and a failure to communicate is a part of that conflict. And this is where humility comes in. Poor listening is often a very clear sign of pride. Poor listening is often a very clear sign of pride. It can oftentimes communicate, and even thinking about the context of receiving the word of God, of receiving truth, it can also often communicate, I, 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 I re, I'm reading this, and I, I hear words coming out, but, but I don't really care. Or, um, yeah, I'm listening to this sermon, but, but, but I don't really need this. this. This text came up next for someone else in this room, not me. Or even, yeah, I hear this, and when we're going through this, but, but I already know this. I already know this. I don't really need to, to hear. I don't really need to listen. And so what's the solution to that? Well, it's the same solution to any other time that we are proud and arrogant, right? Humble your heart. Humble your heart. And listen. Humble your heart and listen. And James is very descriptive when he writes this. Be quick to hear. Be quick to hear. This is to be swift, to be speedy. This is letting only a, only a brief period of time even pass before this is the, the posture and position that we have before truth when we are listening. We are to be quick to hear. You think of a runner jumping off or coming off of the starting blocks. Uh, they they want to they begin that race at the soonest moment possible. In order for them to do that, in order for a runner to be able to start immediately and be quick to start this race, that runner has to be ready. All right? That runner has to be intent. That runner has to be prepared and focused. It's the same for us. In order to be quick to hear, we have to be intentional about it. We always have to be ready to hear and always ready to listen. And if we don't have a humble heart, then that will not be true. That will not be the case for us. Pride will get in the way. So we're to be quick to hear. This word is a very, very just a common word. It's, it's the, the, the most kind of uh, fundamental word that you'll find in the Greek language for literally just hearing things, your ears receiving an audible signal. And yet, even with it being having that simple of a meaning and simple of a usage, oftentimes as you're going through the New Testament, it's often used in the context not just of hearing, but of understanding, of listening with the intent to heed. Even, about, even in the context of learning about something. 
Matthew chapter 14, verse 13, we're going to go through a few different examples where the same word is used in, 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 with those kinds of, of, of meanings and implications. Matthew chapter 14, verse 13 It says, now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the town, from, from the towns. And so you see they're, they're just audibly hearing things. Even Jesus is, is the same word is used for Jesus hearing. And then you have this crowd that, that hears of him uh, withdrawing. And they immediately, it immediately uh, pushes them on to action to follow Jesus. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 verse 18 Hold on one moment. This might be the wrong. Uh, oh, I'm just in the wrong spot here. Actually, you can rewind a little bit to 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him who they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have, for their voice has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. Also in Matthew chapter 17, verse 5, the same word is used here. This is just in the very simplest sense, right? He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And here's the, the divine uh, authority and vindication even for Jesus Christ. Listen to him. Listen to him. Heed his words. Don't just hear his teaching, but, but listen with the intent of understanding and obeying. These were all acts of listening that led to action. Maybe a good illustration of this is even what's already been going on this morning in this room. I want you to think about it. As you've been sitting here this morning so far, th there's a lot of things that you've probably been hearing, right? Uh, air conditioner has been blowing, right? Seats are kind of uh, shifting around a little bit. Children uh, making different noises. You're hearing all of that happening, and yet at the same time, hopefully, you've been listening to a sermon being preached. Right, so you're hearing all these different things, but you have been listening to a sermon being preached. You've been listening to songs being sung and prayers being prayed. Hopefully listening and taking it in, thinking about it, even checking your heart. It's that kind of hearing that James is talking about here. It's that kind of hearing that James is saying that we have to be quick to be doing. Humbly taking in truth with the intent of responding. Go and turn with me in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, Moses is once again delivering the commands and statutes of God. This is uh, often called the great Shema, the great, he the great Hear. Chapter 6, verse 4. Starting at verse 4. Again, I want you to hear this read and read this with a full understanding of hearing, not just the sound that comes into your ears, but understanding with the intent on heeding and obeying. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign in your hand, on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Uh, how, how foolish would it have been? How wrong would it have been if anyone listening to the words of Moses here, uh, the words of God through Moses, is here, if they would have said, okay, I, I heard it. I'm not going to do anything about it. Yeah, I heard it, but it's not going to change anything. I'm not actually going to talk about these things. I'm not actually going to apply these to my lives. I'm not actually going to put them before me so I constantly remember the commands and statutes of the Lord. That would be completely missing the point of what it is that Moses is saying here. To hear was not just to hear the words, but then to take action, to heed. When you work through the Proverbs, you see this over and over and over again. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 5. It says, Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. Proverbs 1.8 Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching. You can fast forward to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 1. Hear, O sons, a father's instruction, and be attentive that you may gain insight. Verse 10, hear my son and accept my words that the years of your life may be many. You skip ahead to Proverbs chapter 8, verse 6. Hear, for I will speak noble things, and from my lips will come what is right. Skipping ahead to verse 33, hear instruction and be wise, and do not neglect it. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 1. A wise son hears his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. Proverbs 18, 13. If one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. That should really ring true when we're reading what we're reading in James chapter 1 of being quick to hear and slow to speak. Proverbs 18.13 there. Proverbs 19.27. Cease to hear instruction, my son, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. Proverbs 22.17. Incline your ear and hear the words of the wise and apply your heart to my knowledge. And lastly, Proverbs 23.19. Hear, my son, and be wise. And direct your heart in the way. You would not be able to get through any of those Proverbs and think clearly all the, the author, the writer of these Proverbs has in mind is these words just coming into the ears and staying in the mind. No, it's a call to live differently. It's a call to live in wisdom. It's a call to hear and listen and to respond. Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55, we see that hearing and in turn heeding equates to blessing for Israel. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 3. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make you with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast sure love for David. And you hear that and, and you see Israel being told to incline their ear and to hear that they, their soul may live and that would bring about blessing for the nation of Israel. And yet the sad reality should also bear in our minds of how Israel has rejected the truth, rejected the Messiah. And as 
Jesus points out, we're going to look at this, Matthew chapter, chap, chapter 13, hearing without understanding, and even specifically in the context of Israel, it applies to us as well, but in the context of Israel here, hearing without understanding is actually a sign of judgment. It's a sign of judgment. Matthew chapter 13, starting at verse 14. It says, indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull. And with their ears, they can barely hear, and their eyes they have, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. He's obviously not talking about physical sight there. He's obviously not talking about physical hearing there. He's talking about even their ability to, to understand and their ability to heed. And as a sign of judgment, their ears have been closed and their eyes have been closed. Think about everything that we just read. That was from Deuteronomy through the Proverbs, Isaiah, and even uh, in Matthew, Jesus referring back to Isaiah. This, this idea of being quick to hear and hearing being to understand and to heed and obey, this has always been a, a sign of a humble heart before the Lord. It's always been a sign of humility before the Lord, being quick to hear. This must be a part of the Christian's life, being quick to hear. Not to push our way, not, not to just respond with what we think is right, but being quick to hear with a humble heart. If you're not a Christian here this morning, if you're here this morning and, and you're hearing me address over and over Christians that, that are gathered together here, I want you to know that the, the, the sad reality, if you're not a, a believer in Christ, if you're here and you're rejecting Christ, and that means that you are, in fact, separated from God. It means that you are separated from God. And uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, a letter that is written by the Apostle Paul, says that this includes not only your hearing and not only your faith in Christ, but includes any desire or ability to even hear or obey truth. Listen to the words that are written here. It says, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They are folly to him. And he goes on to write, And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So if you're, if you're not a Christian here this morning, if you're rejecting Jesus Christ as the only way of salvation, the only way of forgiveness from your sins, uh, sin means that you have disobeyed God. It means that you have missed God's perfect standard. And every single person in this room has sinned. Every single person in this room will be battling against sin for the rest of their lives. And yet, for the Christian, we have been given a humble heart before the Lord and given a forgiveness for our sins and acknowledgement that the only way of forgiveness from those sins is through Jesus Christ. And the only right response for anyone who is here this morning and is not a Christian is to humbly ask, God for mercy, to humbly ask God for the forgiveness, to forgive you of your sins, to ask God to give you peace with Him. In Ephesians chapter 4, or Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 or 5, it says this, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. If you're not a Christian here this morning, that could be you. You could be given life through Jesus Christ. You can be at peace with God through Jesus Christ. 
Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're not a Christian here this morning, you can have peace with God through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus made it clear that He is the only way to the Father. It is only through Him that you can have peace with God. If you have any questions about any of that, if you're not a Christian here, and have any questions about any of that, I would love to talk with you more about that good news, that the gospel, the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ alone. If you are a Christian here this morning, if you're here this morning and your faith is found in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, let me just encourage you that a genuine desire to see God glorified in your life. If if you truly want to see God glorified in your life, then that will demand a humble posture before the Lord and a humble posture of being quick to hear. That when you're confronted with truth, when you're reading your word, your first response is to listen, is to be humble. That's the first practical step to rightly receiving the truth. Next week, we'll start to work through the rest of them. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we can only come to you after reading what James wrote there and first just confess how quickly we do not heed this. How quickly, instead of being quick to hear, we are quick to Respond. We're quick to defend ourselves. We're quick to argue. We're quick to uh, uh, quarrel. Lord, please forgive us. So all of that is uh, is sin. Lord, help us to have humble hearts before you and your word. Help us to have humble hearts before one another. Lord, help us to be quick to hear. And to quick to hear with the intent on obeying what it is that we're hearing. To be quick to hear with the desire to understand your word and to heed it. Lord, let us not be found in a position even of discipline under your loving discipline. Uh, Lord, where we are, may even find it difficult to understand truth because we have been rejecting it and been arrogant and proud before it. Lord, we ask that you would change our lives, and even this morning that we wouldn't leave here the same way that we came because of a humble posture and being quick to hear your word. Lord, grow us into greater Christ-likeness through your word, and we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, the one and only Savior. Amen.